you been? Not bad at all. Thank you. Good. Trying to find the right place to try to have these kind of discussions. So I just moved, so I'm I'm not uh, I don't have I'm not really set up. And Stephen Stephen Group are making me do a lot more of this, you know, for the book. So <laughs> I think I better figure out how to set up a little better. But anyway, hopefully this will work out for you. Yeah. Well, I mean, if if NPR has proven anything that uh, audio is the way to sell books. <laughs> yeah, there, there you go. Yeah. The uh, yeah, I have trouble with the background too. Like I think I've had four di like I've pointed the camera four different directions in this room over the past year just because uh, it's not a studio and it's not really designed to be filmed. So I haven't really been happy with the background. So I just kind of settled on not moving the camera anymore. I'm just mm -hmm. at my desk and that's it. Your podcasts look like they're mostly audio. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, it was audio for most of the the previous year um i've only just started really taking video seriously um just because there there is a potential revenue stream there down the road if you, you can get you. enough subscribers right right because you're uh, yeah I, I saw i i was just looking up a little bit about you and saw a number of the books you've written and uh i found it curious that the little connection we have with maine it looks like you grew, did you grow up uh, somewhere in maine on one of the islands is yep. that right on yeah. Long Island, Maine. Oh, did you? Okay. Yeah. Well, you know, I uh, I trained for a period of my time, my early psychiatry training at Maine Medical Center. And then I'd gone to neurology over at, you know, Beth Israel in Boston. And then eventually became an, an ER doc. But anyway, uh, I had a home in Freeport, Maine, uh, on McCoy Bay in the water. So Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, the McCoy, so, uh, yeah, they were one of the tribes we, up there. And then ended up that my wife and I eloped in 1989 and uh you know got married in this in this house little cottage that i kind of turned into more of a home you know and uh and we we go back to rangeley lakes where our friends are and spend we spent quite a bit of time in in maine it's fairly unique you know so yeah i um i mean i left as soon as i could but um yeah i was born at maine med a, a lot of my family were born and died at maine med it's just no the kidding. hospital of no, oh, no for Mainers. Yeah. Yeah. That's and, not a, not a, pl a pleasant memory, but I, uh, oops, <laughs> hold on one second. I, I do know that, uh, you know, a number of people that come from what areas that aren't as conducive to being year round, you know, like I'm in California now and I spend time in Washington. I spend time in Maine where people, you know, find somewhere to winter, right. You know, that's better weather. If they leave, they seem to never come back. So, I find it interesting. Yeah. Well, you know, a lot of my writing as of late is kind of about growing up in a community where three months out of the year, you'll have a lot of people and you'll kind of have a normal population. And then as soon as it gets a little chilly, everybody leaves. And then you're stuck right, with right. maybe five other kids for right. until next June. Um, right, right. I, I, I didn't care right. for it, to be honest. And yeah, I yeah. decided I not to be like I, I, I one of the commitments I made in my 20s was like, as much as I want a summer home, like I don't think I could ever really be that person just because I know what it was like to be on the other side of it. Like I don't want I a summer home. Well, that's really, that. no, that's interesting. No, I I understand. As you get older, you end up finding that, uh, you know, sometimes, and obviously I do quite a bit of complexity and things that I've done, but you find that sometimes, you know, less is more in having the summer homes. But I understand what you mean by kind of the, the demographics of it, you know, what happens in that as people leave, you know, and I, I remember being in Freeport and my next door neighbors, the Gowers were in their eighties um, and they wanted to sell me a little piece cause it was the waterfront. Um, but they would just stay there through winter, you know, and everybody else would leave, right? Because they're older and they go wherever to Florida, right? Yeah, or something usually, like that, yeah. just that kind of that Florida connection. And, uh, I felt bad for them because here they were in this, they were pretty hardy people, but they're in their eighties and everybody's gone, right? Everybody's left. They're, they're, they're sitting there alone, old, uh, older, you know, and like my friend says, uh, sometimes the worst thing you can be is old and poor, you know, and not from the standpoint of financially poor is one of the worst things you could be. But if you're old and poor in the sense of your uh, social life, your friends, who you have about you, uh, that's a tough one too. So 
I kind of related to this, the, what you're talking about growing up, sort of. Anyway, just just gave me a thought about that. That just a moment of thinking about that. Well, how how do you, that's interesting. How do you how do you relate to it? What what is your um, beyond this the like? What was your childhood like? Well, you know, it's interesting. But I, you know, I grew up in Argentina, in Buenos Aires, Argentina, in basically a large city. Uh, with parents till I was seven years of age with parents who were both concentration camp survivors. And they met after the war, they were younger, they survived. Um, my mom survived Auschwitz, my father survived a, uh, survived a, a death march in the sort. They were, they were Eastern European from Romania and Czechoslovakia and got caught in the war. And after the war, found themselves in kind of refugee camps in the sort something that I relate to having been the board chair of direct relief and doing a philanthropy, you know, across the world in, in what happens really with refugees and, um, and how we as humans kind of, how, how we leave war and pestilence, right? And um, so I was born in Argentina and had kind of this, you know, inner city um, Italian, Argentine, uh, we, were, we didn't have, we were poor really. Um, my dad tried to make his way uh, being a taxi driver. He learned the trade of being a European jeweler. And uh, it was very difficult in Argentina growing up in that way. But as a, but for me, as a, as a kid playing, you know, rugby and, and football, soccer on the streets and the sort and going down to get pizza, I had a, you know, pretty nice little kind of childhood in that way. But at seven years of age, we uh, uh, immigrated uh, to the United States, we found a sponsor, which was uh, one of my mother's friends, and came to the United States with uh, two valises and about a hundred, hundred to two hundred dollars, and that's kind of the true immigrant story. Granted, maybe the legal approach today compared to today's times, you know. So, so growing up had a was kind of a kind of like that New York inner city. You look at back a little bit with the you know the fire hydrant in summer; it's hot. It's just somebody opened it up, you know, that kind of, uh, kind of inner city childhood sort of. Yeah. Yeah. I like the policy here where in the summers there's, you can like look up on the city website, which ones will be opened up. Oh, is that right? Go, okay. it, yeah. It's like an official yeah. program. Yeah. Um, and I noticed, uh, uh, on your website kind of yeah. that, uh, your patients call you Dr. I, well, no, I don't think, you know, when I practiced, no, they call, they called me Dr. Iskovich if they could pronounce it right. You know, yeah. uh, and I, sp I spoke Spanish and where I practiced, not always, cause I've done a, I went into the, really the healthcare business side, but when I practice here, like in Santa Barbara, you know, 50% of the people's surname are Spanish. So you have to be pretty good at speaking Spanish, usually some form of colloquial Mex Mexican type of Spanish. Uh, no, so they, they, they knew how to say Angel which is a Spanish name, Iskovich. You know, the name's not a bad name uh, in, in Spanish. In English, it's like Angel Leonardo Iskovich. But in Spanish, it's Angel Leonardo Iskovich. Oh, that's beautiful. You know, so it has a little bit of rhythm, right? It has a little bit of uh, a poetic sense, Angel Leonardo, you know, that kind of Argentine uh, Spanish names. But um, here it wasn't. It was only in when I uh, kind of uh, went into the corporate the corporate world and merged my company in the physician staffing and the emergency medical business that uh, one of the HR guys said, Hey, you know, I know you must feel bad. Everybody's bastardizing your name pretty badly. Iskovich, Ichkovich, Achkovich, uncle, <laughs> you know, he said, do you mind if we just call you Dr. I, it'd just be easier. And uh, I said, sure, I don't mind. So kind of in the corporate world, that's where the Dr. I started. And, and uh, my, uh, my co-contributors and authors helping me, you know, with this book, Joe Gardner, they, they just thought that was good. And I think they wanted to, and I, I, I fight it a little bit because coming from kind of a physician background, they want to do branding with this, right? It's like, Hey, Dr. I, this is going to be great. We're going to put you between Dr. Oz and the Dr. Phil show. Right. You know? And, uh, and so uh, I think uh, really it emanates from it being easier to pronounce, you know, I mean, and it's funny. I, I remember I, for the 25 years I, I practiced emergency medicine and at the time also had was uh, the beginnings of emergency medicine. I had a staffing 
company we would staff emergency departments and help administrate them. It was the beginning of emergency medicine in the 80s. But I had one physician, uh, which was a great physician. I remember Nils, and he obviously got a paycheck with my name and all the time, you know, Angel Iskovich, right? And every year, he was kind of a wine connoisseur. He'd, he'd send me a bottle of wine uh, with a, uh, you know, a holiday note. And he'd always spell my name A-N-H-I-L-L, you know, and it, it could have, and it wasn't doing it for fun. He just never figured out how to say the name. So, so it's interesting how, we're, how our names come about. And, uh, um, and, and, and even beyond that, uh, just uh, as a story, um, when I grew up uh, in Los Angeles, that's where we arrived um, or landed uh, after our immigration, um, kids would, I didn't speak English, right? So that was, you know, my, my, wasn't my first language, although we learned it fairly quickly. And uh, kids made fun of my name, Angel. I grew up in kind of a tough little Italian Argentine neighborhood. I got in a few fights. Mm. And in those days in education, things always were a bit like being conforming. And as an immigrant, at least in those days, your idea was to conform. Uh, they called my mother in that I got in a few fights and said, listen, not legally, but why don't we just change his name to George? You know, George Washington was the first president of the United States. It'll make it a lot easier if we can call him George. So they started calling me George, you know. So I guess whether it's George or Angel or Angel or Ant Hill or whatever, Dr. I is okay too. So. I don't understand though why Angel would be a mechanism for getting into a skirmish. Yeah, well, I think, uh, you know, the name Angel is a... I think uh, at the time that I grew up in 1960 um, in Los Angeles, you know, uh, angel like Angela, you're an angel, you know, it's a little bit more effeminate or with the boy with the boys and you know how uh, kids will be in their in their youth trying to learn limits. Right. Yeah. So um, that was the thinking then. And of course, in those days, it wasn't like today. Right. That that's very unlikely to happen today to change your name. Um, so it's a, it's a, it was a different time. So, um, I think the name, whatever it's worth is, you know, kind of how you have an identity. When I went to, when I went to college, I said, Hey, wait a second, this, this George name, this ain't me, you know, but I, having played sports, I have, you know, awards and some trophies and all these things with the name George on them, actually, you know, from, from way back, not sure where those are, but they're pretty put away probably <laughs> somewhere. Is this uh, is this view okay where I'm at? Just I'm, I'm yeah. just sitting on a couch, you know. So <laughs> I've had far worse. Okay, good. And I've had people put themselves in profile who didn't actually want to be on video. <laughs> so. okay. Well, I hope this works out for this. Is an okay view? I know. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, we're, yeah, uh, I think at this point, like pandemic era podcasting, you should expect anything other than an actual studio. So <laughs> right. I understand. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm not wearing any, any clothes, any underwear underneath this, you know, I'm very casual, you know, so. That's how I, I did it yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's interesting because of, you know, I write a little bit about this, about of course, how our routines get have gotten disrupted and, and uh, there's a certain casualness, which is interesting regarding certain things we do in routines for uh, maintaining self-respect and dignity, you know? So uh, some of these things have been kind of washing away a little bit. Yeah, so your book is The Art of Routine. Is that out yet or is it coming out? No, it's uh, coming out on, uh, I believe it's May 15, May 14, May 15. And uh, it's published by uh, Skyhorse Publishing and distributed by Simon Schuster. And uh, it's available pre order on Amazon and Barnes and Noble and Simon Schuster and Skyhorse Publishing, all of that. So I get the sense of what it's about, but I'm going to have you explain it in a moment. But before you do, I, I do have a question because your background, based on what I've read, it was in the emergency room, which yeah. is as far from routine as my mind. Like when I think of the ER, I don't think of routine. <laughs> I think of absolute chaos. So how do you go from the ER to specializing in routineology? Yeah, well, it, it you know, it, you know, first of all, um, from in 
the emergency departments are kind of gold, goldfish bowls, right? You could see a lot that's happening when you come as, so you come as a patient, it's a little bit different than if you're a emergency, a team of emergency uh, docs and nurses and uh, therapists trying to care for patients. And um, it's not as, uh, it's actually much more organized on how to deal with the uncertainty of what might be coming, coming on, the uncertainty of the type of uh, um, things that happen in emergency departments come in categories. For example, the big ones that ER doctors are trained and what we do is, you know, cardiac care or trauma care as two big specialists that we do. And then there are these obstetrical care, care for children. And so we have a lot of standardized operating protocols and operating procedures on how to manage this. And although it looks chaotic, it's not nearly as chaotic as it's as nearly as chaotic as it seems. And uh, it, in fact, I wrote a, a, I was interviewed for a little piece uh, on, um, I believe it's entrepreneur about, you know, with today's crisis, how do you, how, what are the lessons in the emergency department that allow us to deal with crisis today, you know? And in fact, those lessons are how to, in working as teams, how to be, um, for example, uh, one of them is to have, uh, you know, mutual respect for each other, knowing how to manage a team. So if you're going to lead a team, understanding um, that you have proper decorum and then having one voice that leads the team in these emergencies so that there's a direct piece and then having, for example, standard operating procedures for all these different pieces. So it's much more put together. And I think, you know, back to your, uh, to your question, um, for me, the art of routine was, has been kind of a, for me, a transition from the corporate world into uh, uh, the, the current world and that I'm, that I'm in and trying to kind of find my way here. And uh, it, uh, it, it's really just an insight into nature uh, uh, that, I, that I learned really in the emergency department about how people survived. How do people survive? How do people deal with stress? How do they deal with distress? And then as a physician learning kind of the, the real breadth of really our experience and seeing just about everything you could ever see in an emergency department. But, um, but um, in fact, understanding that uh, the way we gain stability of patients, whether it was in psychiatry or in emergency medicine is by stabilizing their environment and making things much have greater regularity and time and routine. So it's really, uh, it's a, uh, it's fairly that experience that I've had is, is very connected to the, 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 both the concept and the insight into our, our very nature of why we, uh, why, how we seek stability, how routine helps us find um, stability, and uh, how we as humans thrive in that, in that environment. So I'm not sure that I answered it quite, but there's no, you did. quite that, a bit behind that there. That, you know? It makes a lot of sense, actually, that there would be almost a formula behind the operation that we're not aware of because I never, you know, I don't work I'm far from qualified as working in the medical field as they get. But, um, I definitely gone to the ER for various reasons and it always seemed chaotic, but knowing, I guess it, it makes sense though, that it's really not as chaotic as it, as it comes off. Right. Um, noise is noises there, but, the, the, there are things that I learned about this insight into our nature that I'm purporting here, not just yeah. a, not just a book of prescriptions, because it's not the book yeah. has some prescriptions, but it's not particularly prescriptive. It's just an insight is that in studying medicine and in trying to see when you have severe illness, severe trauma, what your body's trying to do, you learn the physiology and the endocrinology of the body. And it's how, how what it means to be stable. In other words, we our hearts beat regularly, right? In things happening in our circadian rhythms, which I talk about in the book and into many different applications into business or personal life, how um, everything about our physiology is extremely rhythmic, routine, and very regular. And the world that we perceive when you look out and we awake and the sun rises and the sun sets and the moon rises and the moon sets and and um, the seasons occur, I'm talking kind of in a large macro way right now, um, the whole world we perceive and then the way our, our bodies actually work have an incredible amount of regularity, rhythm, 
uh, in times uh, momentum, which is important psychological momentum. So that was kind of my macro view of, of um, how people that, uh, when I studied people that live long lives or people that were high performers or caring for your young and or um, businesses that thrived and did well, uh, artists, writers as well, others, that I found that uh, have that the things that seemed to have in common was this this ability to stabilize their environment even when it breaks, uh, most stable physically, and and then this sense of routine that they did things very regularly. But what they did varied significantly. I saw this in, when I studied centenarians, centenarians, people that were over hundred years old. You know, you you'd really see. This and this is where the, a lot of my thinking started. I was we were studying geriatric emergency departments for older folks, trying to develop specialized areas for people that are older when they have emergencies, so we could focus on their needs. So anyway, going on with that, those are um, those are kind of the some of the uh, kind of insights that led me to understand that uh, there's a reason why and how we survive that stability and doing things regularly, not so much what it is you do, that's your choice. That's the art of routine, right? The art is what you decide to do. It was interesting because with the older centenarians, it'd be incredible. What we would think would be healthy wasn't necessarily healthy. And here they are at 104, 105 years old. You know, it's like, well, uh, what do you, it seems like you do things very regularly and, and you have a routine is absolutely, you know, I always have a cigar at four o'clock and then I follow with my scotch you know, and I eat beef every Wednesday, every Friday. And I used to walk a mile, but I'm down to a quarter mile. Anyway, so you, you saw that uh, necessarily the habits or what you did weren't necessarily healthy in this, in these cases, but what, what you noticed was that maybe the routine and the regularity and that stability of the environment was maybe more important than content. And that's kind of what um, got me into this, you know, we're kind of in this age of, of uh, what I call infinite distraction now. We have so much uh, digital sharp knowledge content that's co constantly taking us to, to try different things or do different things. And we can't really stay in, into what our bodies, I believe, like us to be. For a period of time, things happen and break up. So that's a little bit of the theory. I don't know if uh, maybe that's a little more, but I thought it could be a, a basis uh, for a little bit of our discussion. Yeah, I, yeah, and I actually was going to ask you to unpack some of that stuff because I heard you mentioned it on another YouTube video um, somewhere in my notes, which I'll reference in the description. But... Um, can we start with, because you've talked about in that video as well, and you just mentioned it here a few times, this idea of stabilizing the environment. What's that mean? Well, you know, I tried to figure out an, an analogy of uh, what, this, what that, I, that I used that I called, it was just a common analogy. It's not the, the greatest or the perfect analogy, but I call it the time bubble. Um, a bubble's kind of stable inside, or think about like, a. Uh, I write a little bit in the book, one of my first experiences was seeing a child being born in a womb. Think about that womb that, that that's, it's protective, it's stable. Um, um, and then you're suddenly kind of thrown out to the world, right? Into a, into a, a wild world. And, um, and so when you look at, it's both the physical environment as that you become familiar with like your home, or it could be your workplace. Uh, it could be even in, in traveling, if you're able to maintain that environment of how you travel. Um, it's both physical and somewhat also supportive, especially in the older folks having the, the right people around you that are stable, the people you see every day, like your cat, you know, that you get to be with in this home environment, particularly, which uh, one of the things COVID has brought out is the importance of an environment. Okay, that's, that's, and the stability of it is really, uh, you know, this, this homeostasis, there's, you know, there's equilibrium, there's a number of different terms that allow you to function in an environment you become familiar. And you see this happening, uh, you know, both in, in medical terms, um, 
with the, with how difficult it is to change an environment you're in when you're younger or when you're older and particularly when you're older when someone has been in a stable environment both sensory perceptive their home i mean their home they have a certain routine and you disrupt them you move them away from that like take them to the hospital we see what we call a sundowning syndrome where your body can't really adjust to the change in environment to the to the new the new the new um whether it's uh, the way it looks the heat the people around you in the sort so when i talk about a stable environment i'm talking about both physical and those um those other support people or things that are around you if you want to talk about it that way gotcha So, sorry, our cats are doing what they always do when I start doing these. They get active. <laughs> um, oh, that's, that's great. Uh, so you talked about a core earlier. There was a correlation, I guess, between high performance achievers and routine. Are, I mean, is there, are there... S- specific examples where like, I don't know, the Bezos and the Musks of the world. Um, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. You know, in the, yeah, I see your, well, so in the book I do have, I try to kind of look at high performers and interviewed a number of people. And I mean, one of the examples without giving away the whole book, I guess, but <laughs> was the, uh, was the Rolling Stones. You know, the Rolling Stones have been for 55 plus years now performing and having to perform at a, you know, a, you know, a, a fairly, high level and with a lot of change of their environment as they tour. And by the way, that's an important point of mine. I call it the time travel bubble. It's not that I speak about it that much in the book, but this, that people that are able to perform that have to travel, and that includes business travel or includes uh, the Roger Federer's or the basketball players or, or the, or artists or whoever that have to travel there. Not everybody is able to, to travel and move and have enough of a stability and a routine to actually perform well. And what you find is the people that perform well in general are very, very uh, organized, structured and routine. And, and in the book, I talk about the, um, the Rolling Stones who you'd think that, you know, both their creative process and from what they do in their songs would, rec- would be uh, fairly spontaneous, not particularly organized and routine, but in fact, that's not the case. And being sept- septuagenarians now in their 70s, I think one may be 80 now, in talking to their choreographer who put everything together for them, they said they are incredibly routine. Talking about the example of what's the environment, they have to have their backstage look exactly the same and they bring it with them wherever they perform. They want everything in just the right place. This is so that they have that, this is what I'm talking about, about the disruption what happens to your body when you're suddenly in a different environment. So in order to perform well, they, because of the nature of their ability to do so, you know, financially and otherwise to perform, bring their backstage, which is exactly the same. And then they begin a very, very specific routine, all fairly well timed to the time that they get on stage at let's say nine o'clock. And even when they first come to the town, uh, they'll have a particular date and, moment in time that they'll interview to learn about the town, you know, hello, Cleveland, you know, so that you can say something that you actually know. They, um, um, Mick Jagger will have very specifically almost uh, 45 minutes of warm up at exactly the same time. Every performance follow that up with dancing warm up, followed up with a meeting of, of the group where they actually have a ritual. And this is what happens with routines. They become rituals. In some cases, in sports or performance, there may be superstitious. You might have some of those, you know, that before you perform or before you do what what you do. Uh, And they, uh, we call it busting the crust. You know, they they take a, I think a meat pie and have a little meat pie before they go on, uh, just right before they go on at nine o'clock. So um, I tell the story in a lot more specificity, but that's one example of, uh, of how it aids and maintains stability and performance, both the environment and what you do in its preparation. Yeah, that's 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 interesting, and that 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 
That makes a lot of sense. And uh, I wouldn't worry about revealing too too much from your book. People are going to buy your book. We're going to sell the shit out of this thing. Uh, <laughs> There's um, not that much. It's not. It, it's it's interesting because you know it takes a little bit of time to write the book and then come back in it. And as I've as I've reread it a couple times, there's, and you've probably had this experience. Say, wow, there's a lot of interesting detail here. I forgot that I wrote this. This was a good. This was a good line, you know. And that that so, could literally happen to me like the next day. I'm like, did I write yeah, that? Yeah. <laughs> so that's a you know, short term memory gets worse as you get older, you know. So and the long term memory gets better actually as you get older. But uh, anyway, so uh, yeah, yeah it's, so it's not surprising me though know, that like the Rolling Stones are like that. Because it seems to me that if you're going to make it to that level, that the party meant that the sort of party image, the the wrecking the hotel room image, to a certain extent can't be as true as the legends have it if you are going to make it to that level and stay at that level through your 90s. I mean, I remember they were, they were performing. I don't know if they're performing now, but they were performing well after yeah, 9-11. Yeah, and it's just like, and and they sounded great, and you don't sound great if you're if you're destroying hotel rooms every time you travel. Right, right. You know, and I think it's a little harder to destroy hotel rooms at seventy and eighty years of age, right? <laughs> <laughs> you're going to destroy yourself, right? Most likely, or not. But um, but I I do think that that um, that uh, you know, when you look at different high performers, um, I've talked a little bit. My my friend Angel Martinez. Uh, you might have heard of Decker brands, you know, the ones that make Ugg boots in the sort. Yeah. Uh, he was the chairman and the CEO, and he had a, not a dissimilar history to me where he came from Cuba to uh, New York, to Brooklyn. And his parents got him out very early during the revolutionary periods to come with his uncle. And, um, and so here, he, you know, out of nowhere, he's broken away from his family, comes to be with his uncle in Brooklyn, and um, somewhere along the line and trying to obviously learn the language, similar to myself, learn to survive, he finds kind of this solace in this routine of running, he became a runner. And he found this kind of this discipline uh, um, where as he got into, you know, getting work in the sort would always creep the time out to run, it would relax him. It would, and then this is what happens when you do things that regularly. You know, this is a part of part of what happens. Or people ask me often, "How do I how do I get started? My life's a mess. I can't get anything done in any time in any regular way. If I do it for a day or two, and and the sort." But Angel was able to. Um, he has the same name as I do, Angel, right? So he's had a lot of similar experiences, and and uh, you know, we got to know each other pretty well. But he he um, um, he was able to from that running. Um, got into like marathons, was in like the New York marathons, became kind of a purpose for him, meaning and purpose. And that's part of what I talk about, how doing things regularly, having a routine, um, give you in itself meaning and purpose, even in the worst situations. But but he moved to becoming a high performer. You know, he he, he moved to, uh, to um, basically, he got a job with like a shoe company and then somehow got involved with Reebok and somehow started increased Reebok from England all the way here to the United States and became a worldwide brand Reebok. And then uh, got into the, so to speak, the, the shoe business and eventually became the CEO of, of Decker. And all of that, that regularity, that routine, that discipline, just as one, one piece made him a high performer in business. You know, obviously it takes other qualities, leadership qualities that, that people have. But, um, and, and I understand what you're saying, but, you know, like those images, that's, you know, um, I, one of my friends um, is Chris Carter, who's the producer and the writer, the screenwriter of The X-Files. Yeah, I know who he is. Yeah. Yeah. And um, we were having dinner a while back. I was telling him about my book and routines, and I was talking about inspiration and artists and what inspired you to, you know, write this alien invasion you know series that was so popular in the story about writing and he, he was telling me that he that he uh, that and maybe this is more true to writers i'm you know i'm good at writing a good letter you know i could write a good letter but still to i'm trying to determine how to you know how do you become a really good writer and that to me is just a different journey right now 
in learning that part. But but uh, he um, he told me that he would teach at Pepperdine University, and the students would all think that you know artistic uh, creation uh, came out of uh, kind of the spontaneous spontaneous thought that came to your mind that allowed you to be creative, you know. And and he said I told him the pooey of that, and that they have to have regularity and routine and they have to work at it and that it's not just like a suddenly a great idea that comes to your mind and you know when you look at other artists like oh Andy Warhol or you look at people like uh, Einstein in the realm of you know intellectual and creative really you know theoretical physics you find that um, or be it whoever it might be they that they have a lot of rhythm regularity routine and fairly stable environment when they have created what they create and yeah, I, I mean warhol he, was incredibly routine he yes I, I just interviewed somebody who um does a youtube channel called great art explained in 15 minutes and i didn't realize that warhol went to mass every sunday you know and volunteered at the soup kitchen on a regular basis i mean all these things that we're not part of the whole version of warhol new york ever talks about Right. And, right. Um, yeah. And, part, and, yeah. Mm -hmm. This yeah, is sort yeah. of why, like, I think that you're good for this podcast is because there's a lot of people who listen to it who do struggle with productivity, who, who struggle with getting things done. They want the art life, but they don't know how to get it. And I think routine might be a key for some of these people unlocking that um, because the happiest creators I know have a routine of some sort um, whether it's waking up in the morning and sending out query letters or uh, what have you it's, it's different for every person as you say and even if they haven't quite found the success they're looking for yet they're happy and they feel like they're doing something with their lives just by simply having this checklist to do every single day no right and and, and i think that um what I've tried to do when I realize this is that I, I've tried to connect this to understanding that that's how our bodies work. That's the world we live in. You know, it's trying to say to someone, oh, okay, then it, you're right. I do, uh, I do go to the bathroom at a certain time of the day. I do, you know, I do sleep at a certain time. There are circadian rhythms that allow you to be better um, at different times of the day, you know, to do cognitive work. You know, people say, well, I was a, uh, I was listening a little bit to, I started to, to view the Hemingway series, I think on PBS that uh, just got put out on, um, uh, by Kim Burns. And, uh, and, you know, Hemingway would, ended up being a pretty good father at one point in his life, in one of his children, one of his marriages, because um, what he, the way his life is, his son said that his, that his, he was actually in the end a good father because in, in the end I was thinking he was like a stockbroker because what would happen is that he would take the morning time um, and where it was quiet and he could start early and he could write and and that is a very uh, a, a very good cognitive time you know to to do work right and so by the by midday or so he was available for his family right kind of like a stockbroker at least here on the West coast gets up pretty early. Right. And ends their work at two o'clock or three o'clock. So, um, I think that this is part of our nature to find that, 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 that stable point in the, and when we do things in a routine that help us, help us perform and better. You notice he, what he wasn't doing it at three o'clock and at three o'clock, our cortisol levels drop our, um, I can give you a bunch of the science behind it, but there's a reason that the English have tea at three o'clock. And there's a reason why the, at least in traditional Spanish cultures, they go to take a siesta and go to sleep. And then you could argue the French and Italians have sex. And um, it's not a particularly great focused cognitive time. Um, and, uh, you know, in America, they go to Starbucks, right? I guess, uh, in New York, there's a Starbucks in every corner, though I saw that Starbucks was, was starting to cut back on a Starbucks in every corner. It was interesting yeah. you saying all this because 
I was literally just talking to my girlfriend an hour before we started this. And she was like, "How's it? why is this at three? You never have them at three. And I realized that I usually go between 12 and two for that reason, because my neurons are firing. Correct. And this is a good engagement three. time. Yeah. yeah. So when you look at, and this is in general, because there are people that, in, when you look at the circadian rhythms of sleep and what happens to, you know, cortisol and what's happening in your brain, that's what I'm, I'm trying to, to let people understand that, that if you really start thinking about how you, that we're much more routine, our bodies have routine and regularity and rhythm totally. and our, our, the world we perceive has that. And then when we're best to work and do things. So yes, from 10, to, I did a, a, a little show on recruiting because uh, we used to do staffing, recruiting doctors and the sort. And they were, were, they were asking me when so I said, well, you know, after you've done your spreadsheets and done all your technical work in the morning from 10 to about, Two o'clock is a good time to engage with people. It's a good engagement time. And there's a lot of a lot of science and studies behind that. But by the time it becomes three o'clock, you've come to a low point. And uh, I had a, a, a fellow in banking that asked me, he said, you know, I have these three o'clock meetings in my corporation, you know, in our, in our corp. And I have this meeting and like, I can't get anybody to pay attention. Nobody comes up, you know, I said, it's not a good time to go give people your spreadsheets and your profit and loss statements and go over technical stuff at three o'clock. And even in my, uh, when I was operating our physician staffing companies, uh, I would use that time for innovation, time to get a little bit of food. You know, I didn't encourage them to go to sleep at the time or have sex, but that's what the hypothalamus in your brain is telling you to do at that time. And we would have more innovative discussions at that time until you get closer to four or five o'clock where things again begin to change and become a really good times to do a number of things. So there's a little bit of, it's not a perfect science, but uh, it's been pretty well, pretty well proven. So. Hmm. Well, uh, is our evolution is, is this rooted in our evolution from just the way the seasons work and, and I guess the way, I don't know, I'm thinking about like how we, how we evolve to want to function better in routine. So immediately, like I went to like the hunting, you know, waking up at, at, the, at dawn and going hunting and then coming back at as soon as the light starts to turn blue or something, you know? Yeah. I well, I, you know, I, I think um, I tie a lot of this and maybe it's my nature because my, you know, my parents both survived Auschwitz. And so there's a very survival oriented uh, understructure to a lot of my thinking. But I think that when you look at this, this is how humans, um, a lot of what we're doing deals with surviving in this environment that we're in. Um, and you look at other species, they have quite a bit of routine and regularities and you know, there's reasons you're hunting in the morning because you're the predator um, and the prey is trying to stay away from you. And those are not the common times, you know, that that occurs. Um, so you see, um, you've seen species develop, um, you know, different, different routines and different rhythms through the time, through the, you know, you could, you could watch National Geographic, right, and see everything you need to to understand uh, about other species. But humans, we're not, we're not. We may be the top of the the predator, uh, uh, you know, group. But um, I think we we've, we've evolved with this because this is how this is the life as we understand it and perceive, and how our how our how our life works. And you know, but we too have an evolution as humans, you know. Uh, um, and many things have changed uh, over over our time. Even a hundred years, what poverty was is very different today than a hundred years. I was reading a book, Factfulness, by Rosling, which points out to how how far the world has come from how we define poverty to today. And he uh, he go to the the one of the large international conferences, and he'd ask some of the great you know, minds and economists in the world, these 13 questions of how they perceive the world, they got most of those questions wrong. 
you know, questions like, what percentage of young women do you think are vaccinated in the world, you know, or something like that. And they didn't realize how, how high vaccination is in, in the world, you know. So I'm just giving you a little fact, a little factoids here, but but the point is, is that we've been evolving and, you know, one asks often the question for me, are we devolving? What's happening with this technology and digital age? I, I, I chair a company in the business side that's an artificial intelligence company called Potentia Analytics. And I talk a little bit about artificial intelligence in my book and also in an article uh, that I believe was in Forbes magazine about, well, will our artificial intelligence tell us how to do our best routines? Because now we can monitor our bodies and what we do. And so if we can monitor our bodies and then do predictive analytics, predict what where we're best, then we could be told, you know, basically what to what to do. And so when you ask this question about how we're, of, of, I think about are we, how do we evolve into this, you know, and I think obviously this is a fairly philosophical discussion of, of sorts. I'm not sure it's a necessarily overly practical discussion, but um, you have to ask the question if we're uh, evolving or devolving as humans. And humans often have gone to that point. Now uh, we have so much information now. Um, the term that I like to use and I've seen uh, only once before that I've used is called techmanity, the intersection between technology and humanity. Um, I've seen it written actually in the financial literature, looking at companies that are companies that are in that intersection. You know, those are companies that are companies now with our ability to have big data, genomics, uh, artificial intelligence. We're really changing, you know, how quickly our knowledge in healthcare and otherwise is occurring. And now we're really moving to... Um, to a very different point about uh, what we, what some people consider our, our thoughts that we can be a mortal, a mortal. As you know, some people say, although the stats in the United States are a little different, say that uh, that if you're born today, you know, you have a 50% chance of living to be 100 because of the, you, you know, the, what's happened in our knowledge with these types of uh, of in these type of areas to keep us living longer and keep us healthier. So. Um, there are some good questions about are we evolving or devolving because some of this technology is really distracting us from often our routines or addicting us, right? Like there's quite a bit written about the addictions of social media, the addiction to your cell phones, you know, to some of these forms of technology. And it's all been exacerbated by COVID because we haven't been able to be social convivial animals. We've been apart from each other. And we've utilized this technology to try to keep connected. Um, and so is that connection removing a certain humanness from us? Anyway, although that's a long, long, uh, a lot of uh, thoughts there, uh, and I apologize, Eric, if there are a lot of thoughts, but I think- That's uh, what this is for. <laughs> yeah, and, and I, but I think that really, um, really that uh, we are wired for regularity and routine. And my disruptive thought is that we could probably benefit from it a lot more now. We've learned a little bit about how important our environment is recently. You know, for, with COVID, people suddenly, because they're always running out, suddenly they go to their home and they go, God, I've been stuck here for like a month. I said, why have I not, why, have not, I, why haven't I thrown away that old couch? That couch <laughs> is like, I mean, I haven't never paid attention, but now that I'm in this environment, you know, I want, I want you know, so people are paying more attention to their environment. People have been disrupted to have to re redo their routines at home and otherwise. They've had to kind of redirect them. Uh, I talk a little bit about collateral damage that's happened, you know, both, you know, health-wise from the COVID impacts and psychological damage that's happened. There's, you know, upticks in homelessness. There's upticks in uh, mental health disease. There's a lot of things that have happened. Uh, obviously, people that have lost their jobs. But there's also been some collateral value. And I think part of that collateral value is learning that like when our time bubbles burst, like I like to talk about them, that we intrinsically know in order to survive how to recreate, a, try to recreate stable environments and routines and survive in that regard. So that's a, 
that's you know that's a l- little bit of what's been happening you know today and i do believe that um that we're being interrupted disrupted and uh, we have to be sensible that it's it's not just the content the contents is your choice and can be important whether it's exercise or on the wellness side or how, you know what you eat or how you prepare yourself to perform um we need to focus more on on trying to create regularity in our own and routines in our lives hmm. yeah i would agree with that um even though i see myself as functioning more productive when things are chaotic and I find that I I tend to be happier when I have, and this is a very specific schedule. If I'm up at four, I'm creative from four to seven, and then I have breakfast, then I take it easy and watch a film, then I'll do my podcast in the afternoon, and then I'll go for a hike in the late afternoon. I'm going for a hike after this. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I'll come back and I'll just chill with Jan and have dinner and watching tv and if i don't have that routine i find my stress level starting to rise over the course of the week Uh, and i'm not saying that's my routine every day that's the one that i figured out makes me feel healthy this makes me feel like i can sleep at night right it's interesting right yeah and you know well interestingly there the you know i was just looking at uh another article from a little bit about you know psychologists have psychology has their own terms and uh some psychology is good science, some isn't good science, some medicine is good science, some of it's not good science. You have to really have an eye for, for this, but um, they call it coherence. And uh, when you have coherence uh, to that routine, um, the improvements in sleep are just incredible, you know, as you're talking about. And when you see that it gets disrupted or interrupted, why? Because things happen, right? The cat, the cat gets injured. You have to go to the vet and that's the end of your podcast. It's the end of your hike, you know, whatever. But, and that's really the, the essence of what I'm uh, kind of as a caregiver, a little bit of the na- insight that I'm giving to people to try to deal with crises and to try to also, you know, feel and be happier, more productive, live longer, a little bit longer lives. I believe that's what most of the, the studies say, but we're, we're, it's not what's promoted um from you know social it's not what's promoted in social media everything that we have is very news biting it's very short it's very brief it's to the time um uh you know so so your your distraction you know eventually people because they start to narrow down what they're going to look at what they're going to view get rid of the you know this people that in this in this in this way but it can be even you know, more, more basic than that. Um, regardless, what you're doing is, you know, I could interview you in a book as a successful uh, author and book, you know, and, and how you do that, you know, and um, I sometimes get people, I did the other day also, um, in, a, in a little talk that want to say, well, well, I thrive, you know, I, I don't, I'm not really that routine. I'm, you know, and and I find this with creative people think that they're not really particularly organized and routine, but when you dig deep into starting to talk to them about how, when they feel best, like you were talking about, or when they perform best or when they're writing, um, you start to find that they actually have, they, they don't like to think of themselves that way. See, because there's this, there's this, there's this little whack on routine, right? Excuse me. There's a whack on routine that it's boring, right? And people who are routine are boring people and they don't have much uh, scope to their life and they're sheltered. And if you're in a bubble, like I talk about a bubble, that that's not a good thing because you're not experiencing or you're not growing. And um, so people wanna have an image of themselves that's more spontaneous ability to react to chaos. But in fact, when you look at how your body works, and you look a little deeper. I was interviewing a someone that was a managing director of a very large multi-billion dollar company worldwide and had lots going on at the time and didn't think that they were as routine as, you know, they said, no, you know, I, I don't know about what you're talking about routine. I mean, I have to juke and jive all the time, you know, to get the things I need done. 
a lot of that is really content and, it, and it's occasionally it does break up your your time the routine is just about time right um and the bubble is about your environment right so you know that's the that's why we are using that term as some analogy but i started to ask him i said well uh, you seem like you had things to go and you had to go to europe often and let's talk about travel and uh did you just, when you went to London, did you go to any hotel? He says, oh, no, no, I had the hotel I liked. I said, uh, did you have a particular room you liked? Said, well, yes, I asked for the in the room, the exact room that I liked. Well, what about when you get on your airplane? Did you take any seat or did you have a particular seat? I mean, obviously, you had the means of being part of this large corporation. He said, no, I knew exactly the seat I wanted. And, well, did you travel early in the morning to uh, Europe or did you go a little later overnight? He says, no, we always try to get so we get some sleep overnight to Europe. I said, that's my point. You know, that's my point. Yeah, that's and, the uh, that's that's kind of the point that I was thinking when you were talking about artists who don't think that their routine is I I know for I know people who, you know, they'll stay up till four AM working on their art and wake up whenever and they they would they might say you know I, i'm just chaotic and but if you're doing it every day isn't it your routine like you're not thinking about it as a routine because i think a lot of people think of routine as nine to five regular soccer mom schedule not necessarily the case but if you if you have a constant you you have a routine and that's basically right. how i'm right interpreting this. right so there is that i do get that occasionally and i was on a i was on a little show the other day and uh, someone who's a performer, a comic, and they were saying, "Hey, you know, I, I try to break that up. I do it as I when I feel good." But I said, "So just before you get to perform, is it, you know, because I wrote a little bit about the Rolling Stones. I said, do you uh, every time you perform, you do things differently? You just, you know, whatever." He goes, "Oh no, 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 no. <laughs> I get, I have to get into the right headspace. I know exactly what I want to do. How I'm going to dress. What I'm going to look at before I think about my." my lines and what I'm, how it's going to be structured and the sort. So structure and organization, I think is, is important. And, you know, and a lot, a lot more than, than we like to sometimes perceive ourselves as uh, being, you know, constricted by it or, or freed. My whole point about these things are like, if you don't like what you're doing, just change it, just do something else, but whatever it is you do, do it regularly. <laughs> okay. That's the, the the routine. That's the thesis. That's a thesis. You know, so Makes if you don't sense. like Pilates or yoga or a hike, if you hiking's not doing it, and somebody told you to go do yoga, and you can't get it because you know you've been trying to hike, but you're not, you know, you're not hiking. You don't like it. I said, yeah, fine, just go ahead and start doing yoga. Mm -hmm. You don't even have to do it the right same time. You want to ask me when might be a better time? Yeah, in the morning or. Before dinner might be a better time to exercise for some people, you know. If you're a bit of a night owl, it could be after, you know, seven, eight, nine o'clock to relax you to sleep. But yeah, just do yoga. But whenever you do it, do it regularly. Your body, our bodies are very adaptive. This is another theme I talk about. You know, the Eskimos uh, were able to eat tremendous amounts of blubber, right, uh, from whale. Most humans in their body couldn't take that on, you know, but over time, their bodies adapted to where our livers couldn't do it. We adapt a lot to the environment that we're in. If you think about how we, and when it comes to diet and food, you know, most people didn't have the ability to travel, you know, down Fifth Avenue or whatever and have Chinese food, Swedish food, Mexican, food, you know, all these choices of different types of food that, that, that we eat, they were confined to a staple in an area of food. They weren't traveling away and they use that staple. If you look at refu if you look at migrations of humans, humans have always migrated. It's when there was, um, when there's war, when there's pestilence, when there's a lack of food, right? When there's um, a famine, right? People start to migrate to try to find. Sometimes there's wars because of that. We're coming and getting your food. We're coming to get your your water. We're coming to get your area of good shelter and, and the sort. So people adapt. And so when I when people ask me about diet, they say, well, I'm on a vegetarian diet. I just feel great, you know. I say, well, that's, that's good. And we have a discussion about it. And I say, well, maybe it's not really the vegetarian diet. 
He says, what do you mean? I said, maybe it's just that you eat very regularly and you're eating the same type of food and your body's really adapting to that kind of food. And they would argue with me um, sometimes, but I think that is more of the nature of the adaptability, the regularity of what our bodies, how our bodies work. And uh, I mean, yeah, so are you telling me I should just eat beef jerky every day, all day long, and I'll be, I'll be just fine? I said, well, obviously there's limits to those extremes, but I, when you look at uh, blue zones, I don't know if you remember the blue zone book. Uh, there are these blue zones where people live long lives in, in the world. There are a couple different areas. One of them is like Sardinia, Italy. There's an area in Greece, California, actually. It's, uh, hmm, what area? Loma Linda? There was Loma also Linda. one mentioned in Outliers that in the, in the prologue where they didn't, right. eat, they didn't eat healthy at all, but somehow they had a, like a really long lifespan. Right. And so there's, you know, obviously it's complex because there's genetics, environmental factors, you know, things that happen to people. But but it's interesting, like the longest living humans as a group are, are Japanese women. You know, people tend to be shorter stature, shorter of stature people live longer. These are just factual things. They're not anything about any one group. But anyway, the... The point of the, the point you brought up is I think that we're we are really we're very adaptive, and we when we're have good equilibrium, stability, good food, regu the regularity of all this, it it makes us feel good, you know, and in even the worst situations, um, it it gives us meaning and purpose. You know, this is the the, the some of the you know psychology of what occurs when you just make your bed every morning. And when you accomplish a task regularly, like you're going to accomplish this podcast in a little bit, where you're going to finish and have accomplished this and you're going to go, you know, and so there's quite a bit of a feedback mechanism that, that gives you meaning and purpose, makes you feel good just by accomplishing some of these tasks. Um, and so that's another area that's good, that, that's important. Uh, in the, in, in the art of routine, I, I talk about, uh, my my friend Charlie Plum, uh, who was uh, shot down in a Phantom jet in Vietnam during the Vietnam era, and um, Charlie ended up in the notorious Hanoi Hilton, where like John McCain, you might remember the the Senator McCain, who was a war hero, and and and, and Charlie also was you know a war hero and um, caught, tortured, spent eight years or more. Uh, in an eight by eight cell. Um, and it was interesting because the eight by eight cell was dark. The ability to gain a sense of time or rhythm besides being tortured and just given, you know, water and rice became very difficult until one day, I think uh, it was the Americans or allies that they called them attack the, attack the, uh, this, uh, this Hanoi Hilton, this this uh, concentration camp, uh, POWs, and and shot a few holes up in the in the metal ceiling, and he could see daylight, <laughs> and so he realized that now that he could see daylight, he set up a way to understand what time of day it was, and as he began to set up the time of day, he began doing certain things during that time. In other words, your circadian rhythms are perceptually removed, and now he was able to set up and that that rhythm that ability to do that made all the difference in the world for him to be able to survive to develop a sense of meaning and purpose you know um and uh so th th these are that's just one example uh uh you know in the book which you know i illustrated a little more more fully than that trying to tell the story of, of charlie uh, of charlie plum but but um it's important in crisis and surely for many people, uh, what's happened with COVID in the sort, uh, losing loved ones have, have been crises. There's tremendous crises, uh, obviously going on all around the world and, and, and often do so. This was good. I, uh, the, I think um, this book, this book mm -hmm. will, and, and this whole, this whole subject, um, it makes sense for a lot of the listeners here. And, um, It, 
it comes out May 15th. Uh, oh, May 18th, I'm seeing. May 18th, exactly. Yeah, yeah, by yeah, Skyhorse yeah. Publishing. And uh, what I'll do is I'll link to it on Amazon, and I'll also link to your website. Thank you. And if you have other places you want to direct people, just let me know. And uh, That's so you nice know. of you, yeah. I hope, you know, I, I wanted to, to write a book more like Outlier or Blink, more of a, you know, a, a, obviously it may not, hopefully it'll be that popular, but uh, being kind of a, a, a new author, you know, with, with this thought and kind of this, you know, melding of philosophy and psychiatry and emergency medicine and business, you know, uh, I, um, I wanted it to be more of a little bit of an insight. I, you know, routinology is just a term to talk about the study of routine. It's interesting that there's a lot of behavioral studies in psychology about um, habits in the sort. And routine aren't necessarily habits. Habits become automated things you do. They can be good or bad. They can be addictive, you know. And uh, I just wanted to kind of look at the, the where routine and, and, and where you do these things that you do, where you live, where you, the environments, how important they were. And so I, I, uh, I wanted to be more of an, of an insight. It wasn't meant to be like a religion, like Scientology, you know, or uh, routinology. And, but as a, as a, with my physician background, I think I, I've seen some simple things that people, if you need to be prescriptive for people that are fairly disrupted in their lives, there are, there are simple prescriptions and things people can do. But I, I, I do, I, I do appreciate being able to, to link and have your, uh, your network take a look at the book. Yeah. And, uh, they, you know, some of them are pretty vocal by email, so I'll let you know when they get back, to, if they get back to me about it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, uh, yeah, I would think that, uh, the, um, you know, the, the, obviously in trying to build the argument through the book, I, you know, we try to give some of these different uh, examples, but I, I think kind of in the realm, uh, a little bit of, uh, looking at some of your po artists and writers and in the in this kind of very creative world um and somewhat intellectual world i i think there, there'd be some controversy about the this the, the concept of it but uh maybe but i think uh over i think if people dig a little deeper those that have been successful i think they'll find a lot more organization and structure in their lives than they they might otherwise believe yeah and to, to be totally honest with you, like it fits with the pattern of some of the people I've interviewed who have been enormously mm -hmm. successful. Um, the the whodunits always came back with some sort of indication that they had a routine. And this fits into sort of the similar advice that a lot of the creatives have, have been providing on this podcast is um, have a system. And of some kind and yeah. um i was interested eric if uh where you see those that don't or where you see the failure you know the other side of the coin the people that are that are struggling they're trying yeah. to uh so, they may have a lot of intrinsic talent right and and ability but they can't you know in this you know i in this world where you're trying to kind of stand out a bit you know uh yeah and say, look at me, look at me, right? Whether it's through social media or what you've produced and the inability to kind of get that, that organization, that structure to lift you. Uh, yeah. I just, I wonder if you've, if you've seen the, the struggle side of it. Well, let me tell you, I could go on for another three hours about this. Some of the most talented people I know ha have failed at creating an art life for themselves of any kind and it's it's rooted in a multiple in a multitude of different like issues some of them are uh societal being not being born in the right city not having the right network not being able to network um if they move to the right city that sort of thing but then there was also a whole lot of disorganization in their life they haven't quite figured out how to make it a priority and how to work that priority into normal functioning. So one of the biggest problems is as soon as somebody gets a day job that they can rel stand at a relatively regular level, that kind of becomes their life. And then they don't work 
the other thing into their routine. How many people have I met that have moved to New York and left a year later because they they stopped practicing? Or uh, same thing with LA. LA is even worse. You go there to make movies. Nobody's making movies. <laughs> Everybody's talking about making movies. Hardly right. anybody ever does. And it's because they, you know, they, they fall into almost a bad routine and a dependency on that. And um, this, is, this is specifically for my audience listening. You have to work what you want to do with your life into your routine. And you have to stay with it every single day. It's like the, the, you know, I did an MFA creative writing program. That's what my master's is in. Right. The most recurring bit of advice is have a regular writing practice every single day. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I thought writing was about uh, the dictionary before <laughs> before I went into that thing. I'm like, oh, I, I don't really have a huge vocabulary. I could give a shit about grammar. Um, I like misusing the M dashes <laughs> for my own purposes. And they're like, no, it's just actually about a, this whole program is about helping students create a regular writing practice every single day. We don't care if you don't use grammar, right? We don't care how passionate you are about language. Although I think that you need to have some sort of passion for language if you're going to do it. Um, it was really about creating a routine. And I think that that's the same thing across the board. Uh, by the way, I think you could, when, when things open up again, you should lecture at some of these programs because I'm glad to, sure. it was hard for them to hammer in to so many students the importance of this. Yeah. You know, one of the, uh, you know, I try to do that. You know, sometimes you think an insight that this is how our bodies work, you know, would be, wow. And that's how the world we live in. Oh, okay. I get it. I guess that's why I should do this. But the the concepts of discipline are is a very interesting, you know, psychology. How do you develop discipline, right? Because yeah. you can give someone the roadmap, but will they do it? And and part of part of uh, the you know the psychology of doing something and doing it again is is just about doing it over and over again. It then becomes part of what you do. And that's because that's how our bodies will adapt to doing that. As long as it's not aversive, painful to you, yeah. you know, your body will give you a little bit of dopamine, you know, talking about a little bit of science behind it. And um, for some people are totally disrupted. They just have to get going with any one small thing that they can do every day, you know, and um, for people that have had really uh, s- some psychological issues, I, I started to do a little bit of prescription work on, on, on one simple one was doing an affirmation every morning, you know, using your technology to use an affirmation. I remember watching Stuart Smalley um, and uh, you know, it's well, every morning he gets up and says, what it says, I'm, I'm smart. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm smart enough. I'm good enough. I'm smart enough. Gosh, darn it. People like me. You know, that was like his affirmation every morning, right? Because he was insecure, right? But um, I've, I'm even personally doing an affirmation. I, I put it, I put it on my calendar, it, it, so it reminds me at seven o'clock every morning or six o'clock or whatever, and um, and I try to think of something about the day that's going to be uh, good. It could be every day, like you know, today's going to be a great day, and I'm going to be productive because I'm going to write my second chapter today of the, whatever, however it is you want to do it. And that just that simple affirmation, doing it over and over again, begins to get you into this rhythms and routine. Yeah. And, um, and then um, I've also, you know, one of the replacements for something that's kind of gone is nighttime prayer. You know, how the kids used to go and pray before they went to bed, you know, that, you know, as, as re- religiosity is changing, right. In, in our world today. Um, A nighttime affirmation is a good one, too, before you go to bed. You know, we found there's some studies that show that people who think through, you know, especially people who are busy, they'll think through what their next day is and what they're going to do. And then they go to bed. They they actually go through it instead of letting it ruminate. But um, so there are there are some little things to that you can start off with to get you in this routine that gets your body working. And then the routine builds on on itself. And then other things start to become kind of fit into place. So there are some prescriptions to 
to, you, you know, like you might have suggested about when you write, when the right time to try to write. And just even if you can't do anything, just go do that that moment. Try it, you know. Yeah. So. And, and, you know, just because you're writing doesn't mean you have to write a masterpiece. This was also a big confusion with some people that I went to school with is they didn't think it was worth it unless it was going to be worth it. Right. Yeah. But if you could write a masterpiece at 4 a.m. every single weekday, then what, are you, what the hell are you doing in an MFA program? <laughs> like, <laughs> right, right. like you're if not you're expected a, mean, to turn a, out yeah. the great Gatsby a, every single day. Right, right. If you're a prodigy or a, or a savant, <laughs> right, there's no need to come to the MFA class unless you're trying to be social and meet some other writers, right? You know? Exactly. So, so, I mean, it's, it's just you know, the act uh, of doing. No, it, 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 it's, um, it's interesting. And, and, you know, my, my thinking was a little bit that there are some people that are maybe savants or talents. They're a little bit offbeat. They're outliers, so to speak. And they haven't been able to get a routine um, that is in good rhythm to let them produce, you know, to produce uh, what what they're skilled at, you know. And uh, um, anyway, um yeah, I think there's a little bit of kind of this immediate gratification society now, just talking a little bit more and just uh, in that regard. And uh, I don't I don't speak too much of it in the book, The Art of Routine, but I do feel that it was like, um, you know, my I think it, I think it was my my uh, co-author, Joe Garner, was telling me that when he worked with Dick Clark in Westwood One, Dick Clark would. Tell them, look, if you want to sell books, you got to give people what they want. You know, they want to know how to make them pretty, healthy, wealthy, skinny. That's what they want to hear, yeah. you know, and um, and they sometimes people just want the one, two, three. And there's a bit of a and there are people that need that want that, you know, but um, the solutions to being uh, having a, a, you know, world class book or or short story or whatever they're, 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 it's not a simple one. They're not simple one, two, threes. There's no, there's not the same shortcuts. So a lot of people looking for that immediate gratification for that shortcut today. I don't know if you've noticed that at all, Eric. Oh yeah. Everybody wants a recipe. Uh, I see that all the time with the podcast and some of the feedback I get is everybody wants the recipe to success. Everybody wants a recipe to health. And I was a videographer on a podcast that we, I mean, we had every self-help author you could think of come through that podcast. And, you know, all the people who were following the podcast and commenting on the LinkedIn of the, of the, the guy on it, uh, it's the same thing. Everybody wants that, that recipe. But there isn't a single recipe for everyone in every situation, especially when it comes to, this, to, to business. Because, you know, once one door is figured out, that door closes right behind you, right? So if I figured out how to get to Sundance and win Sundance what I figured out isn't going to work for anybody else, that kind of thing. But right. what can work for everyone is routine. Right. Yeah. I, there are some basic underlying pieces and, you know, that's a little bit what I learned in medicine. You know, they talk about the art of medicine and the practice of medicine. And, you know, we used to say always, you know, when you looking at a patient, they're telling you, or they have certain symptoms or signs that they're showing, you know, when you hear these, you, you, you think horses, not zebras, right? You start, you know, that this is not some unusual thing. And so there are some underlying things that are, that are basic, right? Just as this is to our nature, the rest is the art and the specificity of a person and how you treat uh, someone. And that's why it's, um, it's difficult to find just a simple theory or a simple approach uh, to, to the to these subjects. And I'd imagine too that like some people will know themselves enough to kind of know how to get there, right? How to figure out what their routine is, what the art is for themselves. Then there are people who are gonna have to soul search simultaneously while trying to figure out what their specific art is going to be. Because right. um, there's a lot of people who don't know themselves, especially right. people who haven't quite made it to 35 yet and they're, they're right navigating life you're trying to yeah you're 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 a little little bit of ahead of yourself so yeah and there is it's, it's interesting you know i look at demographics of millennials and some of what's happening and the changes in the and in, in particularly in business and in the workplace a lot is done about how how that demographic and change 
And now, of course, you're talking about the Z generation and you're seeing these changes in demographics, which, uh, of course, I'm older than you are, but you start to uh, understand that there, that those are real changes. The experience of certain people in your own life is different than and, and expectations of what they are in other people's lives. I, I mentioned Bob Hope or Frank Sinatra to, to some younger person a little while. They didn't know who they were. Okay, and then I, then I thought to myself, would, would I have known, would I have known who, I'm not sure who my parents listened to, but, you know, who they listened to in the, in the, in the thirties or forties. And they mentioned this famous, would I have known that person, you know? So it, it's interesting whether, you know, how one is growing up with certain levels of, of experience in the sort that we're not necessarily all exposed to. And uh, um, anyway, so. Yeah, I also don't, so I, the thing is, is I tend to be very unforgiving about that kind of stuff because I've made a conscious effort to make sure my knowledge of this, my knowledge, especially of music, is diverse as possible. So you could, in my collection, you'll find Taylor Swift, but you'll also find Marlene Dietrich. You'll find Frank Sinatra. Yeah. And it's just like. You have a lot of breath. In, in that, yeah. Yeah, and, but I also think that that goes a long way to just, if you're going to have a podcast, know who the hell people are talking about when they drop names like you just did. Like, I know who, exactly who you're talking about. Right. Uh, and it's just, uh, I guess some people, it just doesn't affect their lives in any kind of way to know who Bob Hope was. <laughs> no, well, they have no, you know, it's like anything like uh, the aesthetics of art. I used to teach a, a course on aesthetics and, you know, sometimes certain things don't give you an aesthetic experience, but the more you know about it, the more you can, you understand and have, create value, right? It makes for value, right? So um, if you've never heard the song or heard the joke, you know, from, you know, you might, it'd be very difficult to, to ascribe value to it. But I have found that there's tremendous, you know, breadth in, in humans and um, both in their education their intellectual level, their curiosity, you know, um, and um, and so it, it's broad. It's broad, you know. And obviously, one chooses who, where you're going to be that makes you happy and 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 may stimulate you. And but but the breath is 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 very broad in humans. Uh, it's what that's what I've learned. On the other hand, I the human anatomy is not even perfect, but it's pretty similar, right? There's certain underlying similarities, right, that you can use when people are in crisis mode or so that you you pull from right but then the breadth of of people's um uh, ability how they how they you know how they work i mean how social groups get together you know now for example with covid there's there's going to be a change in hygiene okay yeah, and how our, our so. hygiene habits have been focused on and people that didn't understand why or where they still were forced to do those changes and learn them they became new habits, you know, uh, to a certain degree. And uh, I think you see the the, the, the breath of, I always kid around with my friends and say, hey, the big equalizer is getting a driver's license. <laughs> you know, once you're in your car, anybody can be driving the car. It doesn't matter who you are in the car. You know, your identity is removed. This is kind of an existential thought because I, I come back from a background in Sart Sartrean existentialism. You know, I have a big background in existentialism and I always think like when I'm in the car, whoever I am, the fact that I'm a physician driving quickly to get to uh, to an emergency or something, it once you're in the car, your identity's removed. It doesn't matter unless you've got a motorcade with flags, you know, hmm. saying who you are. You don't know who really you are, and so I I think there's always an underlying equalizer of what makes us all human is what I'm trying to say. Anyway, well, thank you for. Uh, chatting with me it's been a you know great pleasure and i i like uh, I, I try to uh i understand and evolve a little bit more above and beyond the book uh when i talk to people like yourself about um you know what's what's really the relevance of of uh of the message and of these thoughts you know and, and this underlying nature and uh you know surely you know this has enough legs that it can be very academic you know i can go into a lot of scientific detail and the sword and there's a lot more to really to, to be known about how how important it is but there's surely some people that uh who are trying to achieve 
or live better lives or their lives are really disrupted that that need to focus more on this part, this aspect of their lives. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. And appreciate having the, uh, like, the venue. Thank you. I think this is a great idea for a book. I look forward to its release. I will read it when it's released. And then, uh, thank you. At some point when your next book is out and we're back from the pandemic, maybe we can do another one in person. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah. Wouldn't that be nice? Yes. Yeah. The, having a, a little bit of uh, you know, true social time. Yeah. You know, I'll have to, we'll, 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 I think we'll have to get cl new clothes, right? Or are we going to be casual this? Are we going to be in gym clothes doing this with our old shirts? Or are we going to have to get, if we start meeting again with each other, are we pulling out our, what's our new uniform for this stuff? I'm hoping to have purple polos with my logo for everybody. Oh, there you go. <laughs> that's my there goal. You go. I like that. We'll see. Eric we'll Ross see. podcast. Yeah, a little uniform. That's right. Yeah. Sounds good. Purple's that's become the color of the podcast. So. <laughs> well, that's great. That's great. Well, thank you. Yeah. Well, that's great. Well, thanks again. Really enjoyed it and uh, yeah. appreciate the opportunity to talk a little about the art of routine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.